Shall I start? Oh. Okay. So now I'm getting voices from <laughs> from the back. <laughs> okay. So uh, methodology patterns. Now. First things first, here I won't be giving you any solution to anything, okay? What I'm hoping for is to give you some ideas or a different point of view of how to look at methodologies, yeah? Uh, and hopefully some practical hints on how you can approach building up a methodology for your own team. Yeah? Also, what I would like to have, since we have plenty of time, I'd like to have some interaction, so if you have questions, comments, if you disagree with me, yeah, please say that because I want also to test my own ideas, yeah. So basically, my main goal is for myself to learn something and as a side effect, give you something, something back, yeah. So for the ones that are not quite sure about the session, there is a 15 seconds version that is projects and teams differ, so no one methodology won't no, uh, so one methodology won't fit them all. Yeah, this is Alice Alcobron quotation. This is me, we are solving the wrong problem. When we talk about methodologies in the debate we have in the community, I think we are solving the wrong problem. The two minutes version, I don't see, I see, okay, nobody left yet, so you probably want the two minutes version. Again, same thing, there will never be any universal methodology fitting all projects. Haphazard mix and match of practices is not a solution. Sometimes uh, I work as a consultant, hopefully of the good kind, yeah, not the bad ones uh, Dave was mentioning. <laughs> and sometimes I ask, uh, oh, how do you work here? What do you do? We are agile, kind of. Basically, what they mean is we are trying stuff out. We don't quite understand what we are doing, yeah? And usually they are not that su successful. And then what I propose is say, okay, we can actually use patterns and pattern languages that to describe what we do and how to relate all our practices. And this can help in find what works and what doesn't in our own context. Yeah? And we can use them to create an appropriate an appropriate methodology for each project. This is the short, very short version of what I'll be talking about. Another thing is that I'm, I'm not going to talk about Agile. I'm not interested in Agile. I mean, I mean, in the Agile community, I'm sick and tired as Frank Davies of hearing people talking about Agile. Are we, you know, how can we become more Agile? How can we do these things? That's not the point. That's completely, is missing the point completely. Because this is about being more effective from a company perspective. From a team perspective, you want to do stuff that makes sense, okay? You want to solve a problem, yeah? It's about being more efficient, basically solving a problem without w wasting time in pointless things, yeah? You don't want to do pointless stuff for the sake of the process or, you know, things that don't really add anything to what you are doing. And having fun, as you can see, this is not a mistake, it's a bigger point. Having fun here doesn't mean going to your office to have a laugh with your colleagues. Well, that is a good thing to have a laugh with the colleagues, but having fun here is used in, a, in another way, is enjoying what you do, yeah? Waking up in the morning and going to the office saying, I'm going to have an interesting day, yeah? It's the fun we have when we solve a problem in an elegant way, yeah? It's the fun we have when we see our users that use whatever we have done and they say, you know what, you've done a good job. Yeah, this kind of fun I'm talking about. And this is in a bigger font because if you don't have this, forget about this. If you don't have fun, forget about being effective, efficient, methodology, everything else. Nothing will work for you. We'll have a mess. Yeah? Of course, I'm not inventing anything here. And I love this quotation because somehow describes the software world pretty well. You know, from time to time we come up with new ideas, new technologies. Then you look back 30 years earlier, they already thought about that, yeah? 
So I won't be claiming ownership on the ideas. Okay? I'm trying just to connect some dots and I'm trying to somehow uh, try to find a broader audience. Okay? This is the whole point. And so to prove that, these are things I found, you know, Googling around. A pattern language of competitive development. development. This is 1995 or Cunningham, where basically was describing a pattern language to how to approach developing software in a specific context. Because it says, you know, describes a form of software development appropriate for an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial organization. We assume the entrepreneur to work in a small team of bright and highly motivated people. So basically, it's a pattern language for a small methodology. Yeah? So, ideas there. Then Googling around, but now this site I think has been brought down by the owner. There was this guy that came with the methodology patterns thing. Yeah? And then he was collecting some patterns in this wiki, but they were not very con well connected, just a few of them, and then just, I think, he basically closed down the website recently. And still, there were, you know, uh, both the work coming and this have the germ of the idea, but it's not quite what I'm looking for here. There are there, is, there are things missing. This came closer. Here's a presentation. Ah, by the way, in all the slides you'll find where, you know, if it from, comes from the web, I, I put the, the reference, yeah? The URL. So uh, the slides will be available and you will be able to find out the sources, okay? This, uh, this was a presentation in 2004 uh, by Alena. I, I hope I will read well. The surname is Buchale, Buchal Chevova. It was about methodology patterns, concept classifications, and these came closer to what I'm thinking about, but this is all I found from this author. I haven't found anything else from her, so maybe she had an idea and then this, this didn't push it. Okay. And then there are some other things. Alistair Coburn with a just-in-time methodology construction. If you have read Alistair Coburn works, uh, who knows Alistair Coburn in this, in this room? A few? For the ones who don't know him, have a look and find this work because you'll find the most interesting bits of methodology in his books, okay? And basically, this was the just-in-time methodology construction. That is the whole idea of you have a team, they have to solve a problem, you know, methodology has to fit them, yeah, to suit them, okay? Which is, again, the basic idea. Still, what is missing from all these things is some kind, some form of guidance okay so if you are a master or an expert or a team of experts or masters you don't need to give them a, a guidance you know when they say just get these good guys give them food give them drinks you know air, space computers and they will solve the problem this is when you have actually the people that know what they are doing and these are for example i know of some of these expert level master level people in london where I work uh, developers that actually work in this way so they create their own methodology without even thinking they are doing a methodology at all yeah. And then there are some books. Uh, now, the fact that there is agile, as far as I'm concerned, is irrelevant. Okay, it's just that it seems that when you look for patterns for these things, that they uh, always have the agile thing. But uh, this guy, Am uh, Samadisi, uh, collected some in form of patterns some of the practices we do. You know, information radiators, uh, test-driven development. Uh, uh, I don't know if he put collective for, for the ownership, all the various things, basically the practices of XP plus the other, yeah? But he hasn't put any pattern language there. Then there is this. Uh, I don't know if you know James Copeland, big name in the patterns community and also in the C++ one. And here, he, pro, uh, he wrote a book with Neil, Aris, with, uh, Neil Arison where he describes a set of patterns he studied some companies. I think he studied especially some teams at Borland. And they looked at the way they worked, very effective teams, and they came up with the patterns these teams used. Some of them are also in the previous book. But this came uh, first, yeah? But also he connects them in pattern languages. So this is actually the, the idea I'm talking about, yeah? Uh, the thing is that I think we need more patterns and more languages. But if you want to see the fundamental thing I'm talking about, the, 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 you know, the fundamental idea, you need to get this book, which is very good and very readable. Yeah? So I showed you that I'm not taking ownership of this, okay? 
I'm not claiming an invention here. Now, the problems. So, uh, wh what, what, is, what are the problems I see with the current way we, are, we approach methodologies? Yeah? Well, the very first one is that the mainstream debate focuses around finding the methodology. Do you, do you disagree with this? Does anybody? Have you noticed that there is, ah, guys, we have XP, which works, yeah, works, you should try it. By the way, to, to me, for among all the ones that have been proposed, it's probably the most sound, okay? But this is an aside. Then it comes Scrum. With Scrum, you can solve all your problems. Then Scrum uh, teams start to fail, you know, start to have problems. And then comes Kanban. You know what? Well, you know why you're failing? Because Scrum sucks. Use Kanban. And then teams start to have problems again. In the meantime, there are things like, yeah, there are all these good methodologies, but what if you have a project with 10,000 developers developing a huge, large-scale thing? Scrum, Kanban don't really give you anything. You better use SAFE or DAD or whatever, yeah? So it's completely out of context, yeah? It's like we are trying to find something that fits everybody. And so the typical debate is like this. There is an algorithm. I'm a programmer, so I like writing algorithms. First step, start. So the methodology, the year zero of methodology discussion is 1970 with a uh, paper from Royce about the waterfall, yeah? This is the beginning of times. Waterfall is the mainstream methodology, start of times. The mainstream methodology shows some limitations. Somebody proposes a new or less known or almost forgotten methodology and shows how it addresses the limitations at step two and how it is better than waterfall, of course. This will come handy later on, yeah? Of course, in the first step, this is the only thing, yeah? Then there is the debate that is after a long argument heavily based on personal opinions and often light on facts. The methodology at step three becomes the mainstream one. Then we have step five, go to step two. <laughs> so this is what I see in all the mailing lists that talk about Kanban, Scrum, safe, whatever methodology you can think of, yeah? And along the years, we actually produced, using this algorithm, quite a few in no particular order, yeah? We had uh, Scrum, uh, Waterfall, Scrum, Kanban, DSDM, FDD, this is probably a lesser known one, nobody is talking about this anymore, RAD, EVO, from my friend Tom Gilb, Extreme Programming, then the new kids on the block, that, have you heard of this one? It's called Tumblr, yeah? Which is basically like safe, just with a different uh, picture, yeah? They throw everything at it, yeah? Including the kitchen sink, yeah? You want to do Kanban, we got it. You want to do Scrum, we got it. You want to do Rope, we got it. You want to do, we got it, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> And so we came up with this, but still, you know, nobody has won. Is there something that actually solves all the problems? I keep seeing, you know, in my work as a consultant, nowadays what I see is that most people that do agile, okay, basically means Scrum in their own special flavor of Scrum, uh, the special flavor being the company approved version of Scrum, which is in itself a wrong thing, yeah? And they keep failing, and they think that is Scrum the problem. Yeah. So, and this is happening again and again. And I'm sure it will happen with Kanban if it's, it's not happening uh, yet. You know, and happened before with everything, all the other methodologies. Now, what is the problem here? Is that the focus is too much on the methods and not on enough on the products and the context in which these products are, are created. Yeah? We come here with a solution. By the way, what is your problem? This is the approach we are having. Which, in most things, is, you know, do we use this approach in other parts of our life? 
do we come with solution and then find the problem? We usually don't, yeah? Then there is another one. The other thing is that comparing two of these methodologies in a given context is impractical. What I mean is, probably we can make sociological studies to decide if in general Scrum or Kanban or EVO or SAFE are kind of good or bad or not, yeah? It's like in general, different projects and see uh, with the proper sociological techniques. But in a specific team, how do I know in my team now, how can I decide to compare Scrum and Kanban yeah, on the ground and decide that one is better than the other? Can I do, let's try Scrum for six months, then see next six months, let's try Kanban, see which one is better, and then from that moment on, we'll pick one of those. How can we measure that? Or does it even make sense to do that? Who thinks that makes sense? Now, here there are two things. Imposing it on the team, that's, that's an alarm. You know, that rings the alarm bells in my head. Yeah. And we'll talk a bit more about But even if it is a team choice, you have two problems here. You have to basically collect data on what you are doing, yeah? You have also to deliver, because I don't know about companies that do experiments on that. But also, you cannot try that in a toy project, because you really need to try that in your real project, because otherwise the context is different. Yeah, so it's impractical. No terms. Yeah? And then there is another thing. Implementation details matter. Yeah? But they don't simply matter. They matter a lot. Yeah? So now we'll have a, a better look at this methodology. Basically means that the holes they leave, you know, the things that the details that are left to us an exercise to the reader are the ones that actually make the difference. Okay? Any question, any other questions? So far? But now, I talk a lot about methodology, but I haven't said what the methodology is. I haven't defined that. So I looked a bit around and I went to uh, Wikipedia, the source of all human knowledge, and they say methodology uh, in software development methodology is, uh, is a framework that is used to structure, plan, and control the process of developing an information system. If you see, this is pretty much control and prediction and knowing, you know, it's basically driving the system somehow, yeah? It's very, you do this, do that, and we are able to manage the project. But I find this definition uh, actually not that useful. It's not, in my opinion, it's not that useful. There is another one that comes from um, Alice Alcoburn from his Agile Development book, which I find it better. That is, your methodology is everything you regularly do to get your software out. Yeah? It includes who you are, what you hire them for, how they work together, what they produce, and how they share. Yeah? So it, this also includes the uh, tac tacit knowledge that Thomas was talking about. It is the combined job descriptions, procedures, and conventions of everyone in your team. It is the product of your particular ecosystem and is therefore a unique construction of your organization. This is much more useful. Yeah. How many of you work in companies? You know, big enough that you have different departments you have to interact with. It's like we are a development team, but to do database stuff, we have to talk with a database team. How many of you in the companies have formal interaction rules, like if you want something done from the database team, you have to fill a form, maybe a web form or whatever, then they will come back to you and say, we can do that and we'll do that. How many? Okay. How many of you fill the forms? How many of you have a friend in the database team and they can pick up the phone to solve the problem? That's it. <laughs> That's it, because I, I work often, when I work as a contractor, I often do this in um, investment banking in London, okay? Investment banks have plenty of bureaucracy. The reality is that if you follow the rules, nothing gets done. You have friends and the phone, yeah? The phone 
and closing the frame is not modeled in any methodology at all, but it's a very important thing. Yeah? So that is part of the methodology of your team. Just to clarify what I mean with everything you do. Yeah? But also, there is, what is a methodology really for? Now, the definition from Wikipedia is basically, is, uh, basically about control. Yeah? I want to be sure that I, uh, I deliver stuff and deliver it on time, and if something happens, I know I want to see that happens, but it's basically about control, yeah? Controlling the project. It's like, the project is like a machine, a black box, you have some levers, yeah? And you control it. But the reality is actually slightly different, I think. And I got this also from the same book of Alistair Coburn, because I was looking to something, you know, to tell you that you can also prefer to. And this is much more interesting, because it's introducing new people to the process. This is the way we do stuff here. Again, the tacit knowledge thing. If there is a new hire, they need to get up to speed. I'm sure we are not going to give them the Scrum guide. We use Scrum, study this. Yeah? It basically is telling people how things are done. Substituting people. This doesn't mean, like many HR departments think, you know, that people are replaceable entities, okay? We don't come in the boxes, yeah, that get open, put the developer at the desk and then start coding like this. This is more like we need to hire someone, yeah? And we need to hire someone with the uh, right uh, competence, with the right skills, and also the right attitude for our own environment, okay? So it's basically, if you know how you do stuff, if you know how people interact, uh, you know what kind of profile you want in your team, yeah? This is about this. So if somebody leaves, you want somebody else that can work well with the others and have the right skills to, do that, to get the job done, yeah? So substituting is in this sense. It's not about replacing people and treating them like, you know, pieces of machinery or hardware, okay? Delineating responsibility. So if you use Scrum, there is the product owner. Uh, there is the development team, there is the scrum master, yeah? So everybody knows what they, what they are supposed to do, yeah? This is part of the methodology. Impressing the sponsors. This is uh, more for the methodologies, well, the ISO certified ones and stuff like this, yeah? The big books, which, in fact, is a very effective way to sell stuff, yeah? CMMI, we are CMMI, like CMMI, CMM is not really a methodology, it's more assessing level of maturity, but you know, when you sell the sponsor, we are CMMI 5, we are like this, and so, oh, good. We'll give you our project. And then they, you don't deliver, and the sponsor says, I wonder how, huh? and they are CMMI 5. Or we are ISO 9000 certified, yeah? This is the impression the sponsor bit. Which is an effective, way of selling something, but for a little time, yeah? Demonstrating visible progress. This is the management part. Of course, you want to see, you want to be able to have some levers, yeah? And you want to see that stuff is getting done, and you want to see that uh, people are getting stuck, so you can do something about it, yeah? So that is the part of control as well, but it's not the only one, and it's not necessarily the strongest, okay? And also, there is the last one that is curriculum for education. What does it mean? It means that depending on what you have to do and how you want to do it, you need to somehow uh, teach people to work in a certain way. Another example, I'm often brought in in companies to teach people how to do TDD. So they choose that to use TDD because they say, we want to use TDD because from what we see help will help us in having better quality software. We don't know how to do that. So they bring in somebody that will coach them in doing that. This is what the curriculum for education, okay? So it's basically you decide that in, in your methodology you want to use some specific practices that will be helpful, but you need to bring the expertise in, in some ways, yeah? So let's have another look at the, at the interesting methodology frameworks now. If you look at these things again, what we'll see is that, as I mentioned before, they leave lots of detail yeah, to implementation. So if the methodology is everything you do to get stuff done, basically, just using one of these, you won't solve any problems, yeah? This is, they give you just a framework in which 
you can move around. So like uh, every framework, like software frameworks, yeah, they put some boundaries. If your problem fits the boundaries, you have some freedom inside, you are fine, yeah, as long as your details are implemented correctly. But if your problem doesn't fit the boundaries of the framework, you have a problem. You have a bigger problem to solve, yeah. We are using Scrum, and therefore we use, uh, we do stand-ups. Uh, and then you see the stand-ups are completely irrelevant. You say, well, why are you doing that? Because we are, doing, we are doing Scrum. Are you getting any value? No. Stop it. Yeah? But still people, you know, they kind of cast their own behaviors inside the framework to try to make it work. That's the wrong approach. And in fact, what is one of the very important things for your methodology is the context in which you are. The context means company culture means team culture. Teams inside the company may have completely different cultures. I've seen companies where there is the official methodology, uh, uh, you know, heavily command and control kind of thing, and a few teams that are mavericks, getting stuff done in ways completely different from the official company. In fact, they don't fit well in the surrounding environment, yeah? So it may happen that sometimes they really deliver great and have an influence on the company, or sometimes they, even if they deliver, they get, you know, shot down and sent off. Then there are the skills available, yeah? We need to produce, to do something, uh, pr sell a, produce a product for uh, whatever, I don't know, a mailing system or think about any software thing. Uh, we have to do it in Java because we have only Java developers. One example, yeah? Or maybe Java is not a great thing to use. We would prefer to use Clojure, but we don't have anybody that knows that. So what we need to do is to train the people that will be on the project, yeah? So the skills actually somehow will drive you to, to make some choices, yeah? We would like to use TDD, but nobody knows how to do this. But everybody knows how to write unit tests. Okay, for now we skip TDD, we at least write unit testing, yeah? Customer culture. Whatever methodology you use, the people that are buying your product they probably need to know how to work with you, yeah? Because, for example, situations in which I uh, work out my team was very fast in delivering stuff, the users were not able to do UAT as fast. So you need, you need to tune the, the process because otherwise we are causing trouble to them, yeah? Preferences, people preferences, yeah? Human kind of side of things. Working a Kanban style would be more effective, but we really like sprints. Yeah. So sometimes you can convince people, sometimes you can't. So you better get along with that. <coughs> the product. If you are, depending on what you are building, like a nice Ferrari or another car, okay, you approach the problem differently. This is a, you know, car that costs a, an arm and a leg, so better be perfect in many ways, okay? Don't give problems. This one is cheap. People will, uh, will be more tolerant of issues, so the way you build them changes completely because there are as other things as well. There is also the budget available, for example, or the time available, yeah? So basically, your context defines the way you want to work based on what you need to achieve. And, yeah, what you've got available here. So, methodology and context are strongly connected, yeah? Okay? So, I'm making the case for telling you just, you know, disregard those framework, methodology frameworks if you can. But I'll get back to this. So, now, I'm, I will skip a bit on this because now I think I've, I've shown you what, you know, more or less, the problems, these are the same problems I talked before, so it's, it's not that important. So I hope I'm com starting to convince you that this mainstream debate around the methodology is wrong, that the focus is in the wrong place, and that measuring the, eff the effectiveness of a methodology in the same context, in a methodology in its entirety is kind of difficult, and the implementation details matter, and matter a lot, yeah? So one night, I had a revolutionary idea. I woke up in the morning and said, one methodology per project. 
then I said, well, it's not really revolutionary, actually, Alistair Coburn in his PhD thesis. And, uh, and then he wrote in this, there is the web page there, basically he says, when I was doing my uh, thesis, I, uh, I found I couldn't use the methodology per project as a new result since there was um, ample previous research concluding the same. Yeah? Uh, recognizing that every project needs a different methodology is a hard pill to swallow, but a number of people have seen fit to swallow it. Yeah? And they say, what to do about it? How does one create a new methodology on every project without hosing the project budget? How do we do that? So I think that a way of using patterns and pattern languages can help in that. And I'll show you it later. And so you may say, well, you can always tailor Scrum, Kanban, whatever framework to your own needs, yeah? Because after, after all, they are frameworks. The problem is that like every framework, they are customiz customizable up to a point, yeah? This is from the Scrum guide that you find on the web. Scrum's roles, artifacts, events, and rules are immutable, yeah? And although implementing only parts of Scrum is possible, the result is not Scrum. Scrum exists only in its entirety. This means that when you do Scrum and you follow the Scrum advice of inspect and adapt, you inspect and you adapt, but you better not touch the Scrum thi the sc things that make the thing Scrum. Yeah? Which means that if the way you work means that actually you would, get, you would like to get rid of sp the sprint concept, you don't want sprints at all because just that doesn't make any sense for you, Scrum will forbid you for doing that if you want to continue using Scrum, which is a problem for many teams. They are afraid of doing so because they think they are ashamed of, we are doing Scrum, we cannot do this. Like, but is it working for you? No, but you know, you better do what the uh, master says, yeah? Okay. Of course, not everything is bad here because actually methodologies can share something. Different methodologies mostly mix and match the same tools and practices differently. Look, uh, think about uh, what you do every day at work, yeah? Uh, when we talk about things, or even when we talk about, I was using Scrum, then I tried Kanban, and then I did Scrumban. What they are actually doing there is picking some practices from each of those, yeah? And creating the new one, yeah? It's not that they take one in its entirety, the other in its entirety, like, uh, I don't know, a horse and a donkey and, make and come up with a mule, okay? It's not like this. They pick and choose bits and pieces, yeah? So they share things. So it's not that everything is bad. So we just need to look at things from a different perspective, yeah? Now, what happens is that, f to many things, is that when they realize that and they realize that the methodology is not working for them, they actually try to mix and match practices in an opposite way. Basically, they say, you know, they, I'm, we are agile, but not quite, yeah? Then they go for, we'd like to give a go at TDD, we'd like to give a go at this, and that, without really thinking about, you know, does it make sense in our context, yeah? Uh, you can apply this to any situation you want. You can apply this to information radiators. I've seen teams, distributed teams, that use whiteboards like this one, yeah? Because, you know, whiteboard is better than electronic system. Yeah, but if you have a team that is part in India and part in London, the, white the whiteboard is a problem. Maybe you need to use something else, yeah? If everybody was in the same room, yeah, I'm okay. And this fits the pro the, your problem, by all means use it. But, you know, it's not that it's always the best solution, yeah? And I've seen this again and again. Yeah, basically, they don't understand what they are doing. And there is another thing, that measuring the effectiveness of a practice in a given context is doable. Think about the inspect and adapt. This is exactly, this is exactly what you should be doing. Yeah? We are, uh, when you have a retrospective, things that work, you know, we want to keep doing this, things that we are not doing but we should be doing because we think we'll get some, some good out of them, and things we have been doing but, you know what, they actually cause trouble. And this is exactly what you do there. You are measuring your practices in your own context, yeah, in a way. Yeah, with whatever unit of measure makes sense for you. Yeah. And also, 
I've not necessarily endorsed the studies, but this is also as an example that actually there are studies out there that try to study in a specific context about TBD or they go with the, you know, there are about pair, pair programming or, you know, requirements, ability. So basically, it's easier to find information about the effectiveness of these things than the, inf the effectiveness of an entire methodology framework. And this information tends to be more reliable. Okay? But then we say, okay, uh, which practices? Well, uh, practices can be technical, the typical ones we talked about, you know, the various TBD, uh, per programming, um, continuous integration or continuous delivery or, you know, uh, agile architecture, whatever comes to your mind. But could be management ones as well, yeah? How is the team managed? Uh, what, what the manager should be doing to make sure that the team is effective, yeah? Something regarding his role. Could be about uh, leadership. If you read uh, magazines like the Harvard Business Review, it seems that many people are obsessed with being leaders and leadership, but it's basically how to somehow guide the team in an effective way, more or less, yeah? Or other re relevant classification, really. And actually, some practices belong to several categories. And this is the interesting bit of the pattern languages. And I'll show you that in a minute. And in fact, patterns and pattern languages can provide guidance for this. Yeah? But let's see, first of all, what is a pattern. Uh, who knows uh, what a pattern is, more or less? Have you heard of design patterns? Okay, have you seen the format of design pattern? Like this, pattern name and classification, a descriptive name that tells you, you know, more or less what the pattern is about. The typical one that developers know and is actually a very, very bad one is the singleton. Hmm? Don't mention it in front of me saying that is a good thing because it can become dangerous. Okay. <laughs> but it's basically a name and classification, something that tells you what it's about, and it's also a memorable thing. The intent, yeah? Well, why should you be using that? What is the reason for the pattern, yeah? What are the advantages you're going to get? It's also known as, this is like if there are other names, but it's not that important. The motivation, yeah? W what is the context where the pattern works? Yeah? What are the forces that actually say, we have this problem, if you apply this, you know, you'll get better. The applicability, yeah, so part of situation. The part that everybody forgets, the consequences. Or uh, I call it sometimes the cost as well. When you use it, what, are, what is the price you are going to pay for this? Yeah? So they are not necessarily all good or all bad. They can uh, help you solving the problem. You have a price to pay for it. And this is a very important bit, and we'll see also in the methodology patterns why. Known users, this is to actually understand the things better. We as humans usually tend to understand things better using examples, yeah? And related patterns, this relates to the pattern languages. So it's like if you are doing this, probably want to have a look at this other one as well, yeah? If you are doing pair programming or collective code ownership, you know, everybody can touch it, maybe you want to have a look at pair programming as well. Yeah, these kind of things, they are related in a way. Now here, now I have an example to show you the format of a pattern. Let's see if technology works for me today. So I prepared this. So this is being taken by the Agile Adoption Patterns book I showed you before. Yeah, just to show you, it's not, I'm not going to read it, it's just to show you what a pattern looks like on paper, okay? Just in case you haven't seen it. So, here also there is another aspect. Uh, uh, the, the format may vary slightly, but the main points remain the same, yeah? So information radiator, who knows what it is? It's basically what you have in Agile things, the walls with your Kanban board, yeah? Or um, whiteboard or even sometimes Jira, if you use Jira, something that tells you, gives you information about the project, yeah? What is going on and or who is doing what, yeah? You can have and then here is business value. There is a sketch as it describes something. The forces, 
And therefore, here a bit explanation of how it works and why you should do it. In this particular case, they say adoption, but we are, I'm not interested in that right now. The interesting bit is this, what we call but, yeah? It's like these are the, the consequences of using it, yeah? So um, voids in the information exist, indicating that individuals or roles are persisting their predisposition to secrecy, something like this. So it tells you, look, you may find these problems there. Yeah, so be careful. Yeah? And this is just to show you more or less what the format is, okay? Before you ask this question, which you don't know what it is, patterns are not best practices, okay? Again, now I told you about singleton, the same goes with best practices, yeah, in terms of me becoming dangerous. In fact, there are no best practices. There are useful or useless ones, depending on the context in which you are, okay? Somebody is not convinced about this? Yeah, because we keep hearing about, you know, you should be doing this because it's a best practice. Like it doesn't apply to me, okay? So it's not best for me because I'm doing something slightly different, okay? But you hear about best practices all the time. Then let's have a look at what a pattern language is. It's something like this. Let's be, I took this from uh, Jeff Sutherland's uh, website. Jeff Sutherland is one of the co-creators of Scrum. And he was describing Scrum as a pattern language and, and uh, actually using one of the languages in Jeans, Copley, and Boot. So this is what a pattern language looks like. It basically says, if you are thinking about this pattern, maybe you should have a look at the, the connected ones in this direction, okay? So basically, it's like if you start somewhere here with your problem, yeah? Have a look at these ones because it may be helpful. But let's try to something simpler. Uh, I made this up. I haven't written down these as patterns. I have some on work, ongoing work on these kind of things and I've published anything, but I hope to give you, you know, what, an example of what I mean. So let's suppose that we decide we are working in a team and we want to establish some rules of the game, yeah? We have some code and we say, well, you know what? Um, now, uh, we have a, a collocated team. Uh, we want to avoid situations in which uh, one developer leaves the company and nobody knows what's going on with this code. Basically, avoid the situation of the star that knows everything, which have you heard of the moderate bus factor? So the bus factor of a team is actually a pattern, means that is a number. Is a number that tells you how sensitive to this, to say, uh, uh, how sensitive you are, how sensitive the team is uh, in uh, at losing people, losing key people. And it's called bus factor because it's basically the number of buses, yeah, the number of people that need to be killed by a bus before your project goes in disarray, yeah. So if you if your SAR developer crosses the road in, in uh, Bangalore. But in Bangalore, it's almost impossible to get run over by a car, I suppose, yeah? <laughs> and the bus hits him, and he dies. It's a very gory description, yeah? What happens to your project? Can you still do stuff, or is good Lord? We don't know what to do, yeah? Or to give you a concrete example, I worked in projects where even if the team's trying to be agile and have collective code ownership, if some particular person was on holidays, nobody could do some some things, yeah? So basically you want to have a number there that is high enough so you can do without some people, yeah? Now, how do you get there? But you say, well, if you want to do that, maybe you should think about collective code ownership so everybody can touch everything, and maybe about pair programming as well. You know, there is a way you work together so more than one person knows that part of the code, and if you swap pairs, you know, you, that, that the knowledge gets uh, spread around, yeah? And maybe if you have a collocated team, this is particularly good. If the team is not collocated, you may have problem with pair programming. Even if now I know about many things, I've, I've done it myself, that can actually remote pair, pair, you know, using Skype and other tools. It's not as good as in the same room, but, you know, 
often is better than offering at all, okay? And so basically you think about these aspects of your project and say, well, we, we want to start there, but then it's, ah, we, we want to give it a go at this, but then, ah, also this is interesting. Now, what happens is that, first of all, as we said before, each of these things comes with a price, yeah? Pair programming is a very difficult thing to do. If you don't get along with your pair, you won't be effective. You will just be having arguments for everything, yeah? I don't know how many of you have experience of pair programming. Always good? Awesome. Because it's a matter of getting along. It's a matter of if you actually can have some share touch, tacit knowledge with a guy. You know, you do stuff. You don't really need to talk a lot. And it's like I worked with guys that we were clicking like this. No need to shout or anything, yeah? But I worked with guys. Well, in one occasion, there was one that was a very nice person, very well-meaning, but pairing with him was a headache, literal, literally a headache the day after because he would take the keyboard and would start doing his own stuff and kept talking, blah, 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 and then he would say, well, well, look, if we do like this here, maybe we should, you know, we are done. No, because blah, 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 blah. Three hours later, he comes, you know what, if we do this thing here, we'll be done. It's like, this is what I was telling you three hours ago. <laughs> yeah. So these are not really nice experiences, but this, is, this can happen, okay? So it's one of the things that you can have to, to pay. Then the, the, there is another, the other aspect, what I was saying, the different pattern languages. If you look at this, they are kind of technical, yeah? Have a technical impact, but it's also patterns that could be put into a, a management pattern language. Pair programming has a management implication. Moderate bus factor, collective code ownership have management implications, yeah? This means, and this means that if somebody leaves the company, for me, it's not a huge problem. Yeah, it's a problem if it's good, but it's not huge. Yeah, my, pros my project is still going, you know, to work, yeah? And this one as well. Per programming, there are studies that prove that it's actually as effective as formal inspections in terms of guaranteeing co uh, code quality, but it's much cheaper. I don't know if you heard of Fagan inspections of the code. Uh, okay, it's as effective as those. But the Fagan inspections are extremely expensive. Think about your team, even, you know, even a small team, four people writing code. Fagan inspections, you inspect 100 lines at a time, yeah? And those guys write thousands a day, yeah? And also they refactor the bloody thing. So basically you inspect the code one day, the next day will be different. How, how do you deal with that, yeah? With the pair programming, you basically guarantee the same level of quality, but it's much cheaper because they just work together, yeah? You don't have all the ceremony, all the thing. Okay? And these are management implications as well, yeah? Because I know that my quality will be as I, as I expect it to be. Yeah? So if you think about it, a, a nice thing is that basically you have all these languages that intersect. So when you choose some practices, you have a better view of the, all the implications of your choices from all perspectives. So you can make a better, you know, a more informed decision if you like. Is it clear? And in fact, put here, you know, this is what I already said. Describe not only the positive effects, but the consequences, the patterns. The context and consequences are important. They, in fact, they determine the chances of success or failure of a practice in a particular project. Yeah? This is why sometimes you fail with Scrum or something because it just doesn't apply in your context. But they are very rarely discussed by the proponents of a particular methodology framework. How often do you hear any of these methodology framework people actually telling you, look, this thing, yeah, it's nice, but you should be careful about this or that. Usually they just say, this will solve your problems anyway, yeah? And, and then there are the pattern languages, you know. Give an indication of which patterns work well or not so well with each other. Yeah? So basically, you can decide for yourself. You know, you have a starting point, okay? And then you can decide how to move to create your own methodology. Knowing that a particular pattern belongs to several languages will give you a better view of all the implications of using it. And so decide if you want to pay the price for using that. And the 
prepackaged method methodology frameworks, they tend to present practices as belonging to only one category. You use Scrum with the technical practices of XP. But the technical practices of XP, most of them have management implications, big ones. You know, TDD, fair programming, collective code ownership, information radiators, where you see the status of the project, what is really happening. But they don't tell you that, yeah? And this is actually not giving you the information you need. And this actually leads people to ignore the implications of what they are doing, yeah? We are actually following this. We expected this result, but it's not working for us. And they simply don't understand that probably there were some implications that just didn't realize were there. Yeah? They are known unknowns, po possibly. Yeah? And so some consequences, and these are the important thing. They free the mind from thinking in terms of Scrum, Kanban, Waterfall, whatever. Yeah? It's no more Scrum versus Waterfall, Kanban versus Waterfall everybody else versus waterfall, because that's not the point, yeah? You start to think in terms of what is really important for the project, your project, yeah? Without the fear of doing something bad because you are not following the methodology by the book, yeah? In fact, there is no sacred book, yeah? And, and s <laughs> well, the Scrum Guide. The definitive guide to Scrum that changes every other month or so. Yeah. But also, there is no need to be ashamed anymore for doing Scrum, but not quite. If it is working for you, who cares? Yeah. I've seen so many teams, you know, that are kind of talking to me and saying, oh, we are doing, I used to, it's not to pick on Scrum, okay? It's on the same level. It's just that it's the most widely talked about and used, okay? Just to be clear. And they say, you oh, know, yeah, we are following Scrum, but, yeah, don't quite, but and they tell you this in a subtle voice, almost, you know, we know we are doing something wrong. So no, is it working? If it is working and you are uh, getting the solutions you need, continue doing it. If it is not, not working, let's see what's happening and change it, okay? So for me, the inspect and adapt is a much stronger inspect and adapt than Scrum, a very ruthless one. Yeah, you change your framework if it doesn't work. But also there is the other aspect that the methodology is a living thing. Change along with the surrounding context. You start with a small team of experts. You start put the experts in a room and they will do marvelous stuff. But then the product grows and then you need to add more people. Then when you add more people, somehow you need to add some more structure there. Yeah? Not necessarily imposing from outside, but they will have to follow some, you know, rules of the game so they don't step into each other's toes, yeah? And so you change your methodology because you have more people, for example, yeah? Or you can have the, the reverse thing, like a project that was going on and new things, but then at some point goes in maintenance mode. You shrink down the team, and they need to just support the current customers fixing bugs, yeah? complete change. Maybe bef uh, before they're working uh, with sprints and iterations, then it's just support role, maybe work just uh, with a flow Kanban model, yeah? Things come in, we fix bugs, you know, bugs fix come up. Yeah, you change the way you work, you change the whole approach. And you need to change in this way. You can't be stuck in what you chose at the beginning, yeah? And there is the other aspect as well. Pattern and pattern languages, they change over time. It's not that it's something that is good and is good forever or bad and bad forever. Basically, this is part of the try stuff out, yeah? You have an hypothesis. You think that doing something will work for you, you'll try it out, yeah? And then after people get experience with that, they decide, well, you know what? We thought it was a good one, but actually, now we realize that it's creating more problems than solutions. The example in the software world is the singleton, yeah? In the Gang of Four book, uh, the design patterns book, the very first one, there was a singleton as a pattern. That was unfortunate because it seems that it's the only one that everybody has implemented. At least when I interview people, that's the only one they know about. And they always think that it's good until I ask them about testing it. And then they realize what they're talking about. But the thing is, was considered a good thing to do in some uh, context. Now, in the patterns community, that is considered actually a bad pattern. Yeah. So what, uh, uh, using another term that I don't quite like, an anti-pattern, okay, just to make you understand, but it's a bad pattern, 
is a pattern, yeah, because it's used all over again, but doesn't really solve the problems. Actually, causes more than the ones it solves. But this came after, you know, people having more and more experience with that. Yeah. So things change, and you are allowed to change with them. Yeah. You get experience. Not only this, you can have in your own company or team your own pattern, your own way of doing things that work for you, and you can come up with those and document them as well if you like. Yeah, and create your own internal pattern language. Okay? So this goes for patterns and for pattern languages as well because you even may try things like, you know, I know that these two things are not connected in any language I know of, but I have this feeling, this idea that actually they may work well together for some reason. Yeah? Then you use that and then you discover, well, actually, yeah. yeah let's suppose that you weren't sure about pair programming, uh, I don't know, a collective code ownership, whatever. And you try them together and say, actually, these things fit well. You know, they are connected. Yeah? Okay, so also the languages change over time with, uh, with experience. Yeah? The whole point being, you don't need to be stuck somewhere. You don't need to be stuck with your first choice. Ever. And then how go to documenting this? Now, I'm trying to do some work on this, but unfortunately, I'm being more, much slower than I hope to. But anyway, you can find these things both in uh, software books, yeah? Books, but also in magazines, and also in things that are, since as a agile conference, that are not classified as agile. What I mean is, n now that we are in the agile era, this doesn't mean that people have been doing things wrong before us. Yeah? Doesn't mean that. What it means is that we are trying to, for, for some, situ uh, we are trying to somehow learn from the past and trying to change what didn't really work. But we want to keep the good bits. And keeping the good bits sometimes is also, you know, this is a, a about traditional requirement stuff. But I can assure you that if you read this book, you'll understand a lot better how to produce a proper user story, for example. You'll understand that maybe you need to talk with the users asking questions instead of asking them, what do I need to do? And they say, blah, blah, blah. You go and produce blah, blah, blah. And then the user says, what's that? You know, this is not what I wanted, yeah? So because these requirements things say that it's about the conversation, about, it's about techniques used that come useful, yeah? Also in the, in the new world, if you like, okay? But now, I've said lots of things, but how do we actually use these patterns? Yeah, how, wh what is the basic idea? Because uh, practically, how can we go with that? So first of all, we need to understand something. Before trying to uh, create a methodology or change the one you have, you have to understand why you want to do that. You have to have some goals in mind. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Yeah. Saying we want to become agile is not a good answer because it doesn't make any sense. The problem has to be something real, concrete. We have some quality issues here. How can we address them? Yeah? Things like this. Or if it is a new project, it's like, okay, this uh, software is, will be used in these medical devices. By the way, we can kill people. How can we write software in a way that the chances of killing somebody are lower? What kind of practices can actually help us? I mean, the word help. So it's not that they will ensure anything, but will make more likely that you will succeed at avoiding bugs in operation, yeah? Okay? So you need to understand what is your context because this is, uh, at the end, I put also um, a slide with all the books and things from a book, Return on Process, with this guy, Michael West, and he says, you know, of course, is the key is understanding what to improve and why. Yet it's both astonishing and disappointing how many improvement initiatives are launched without anyone asking and answering those, these two most primal questions. Yeah. So in your companies, why do you do Agile? What is the reason? Yeah. Once you know that, you know what you can do to achieve those goals. Yeah. And Another thing is understanding the real context. Now, what I mean here is, in companies usually you have a defined process, it's the official thing, yeah? It's what everybody should be doing in most big companies, maybe not in all. 
But then there is what people are doing. Yeah? You have the procedure to interact with the DBAs, but you use the phone. When you go for a change, what you want to see first is to understand the perform process. Don't care about the defined one. You need to understand what people are really doing on the ground. Because it might well be that they are doing the right thing plus compliance work to look as if they are following the official one. So maybe just, you know, remove the official one altogether will solve your problems. Yeah? So you need to spend time to understand this first. Otherwise, the risk is, like many companies do, is to address the problem of changing the defined process, which is completely, you know, useless. So, using the pattern, as I said, set the main goals. What are the goals for your particular context? What do you want to achieve with your product? Yeah? What are the characteristics has to have? Yeah? Okay? Understand the context. Choose the patterns that best match goals and context. Yeah? So we want to uh, have this, um, I don't know, web application, uh, customer management application. We want it to be high quality, doesn't have to have bug in production because it's, I don't know, it's a, for a phone operator who is a customer that is very picky about that. And if it goes down for an hour, they will lose lots of money, stuff like this. Okay, we need to guarantee a certain level of quality. We have certain amount of skills, yeah? We know Java, maybe we need to do this in Java. We know, we don't really know TDD, but we know how to write unit testing, well then we'll be, we can use unit testing. You see, you start to figure out what kind of things you want to use there, yeah? And make sure you will use them, yeah? And then inspect and adapt. You try stuff, if stuff doesn't work, you change it, simple. Yeah? But you need to keep in mind a few things. As I said, the real context may be different from what you see. Yeah? Define the best to perform. And then the, the methodology has to work for the people using it. This is where uh, some methodology changes fail miserably. Yeah? Basically, if you go to bunch of developers from now on you'll be doing extreme programming in, in full you can be sure that will be a mess I worked in a team like this the, 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 the mandate was for the team you use, shall use all the practices of extreme programming this was 2004 and there were people that were extremely unhappy for, with the pair programming they didn't know how to do proper TDD and the software was a bloody mess yeah we were doing extreme programming we had huge problems of quality huge problems of team interaction, huge problems of, of everything. Then one interesting thing happened. At some point, finally, the manager realized some of the problems and then said one day, you know what, okay, if you hate pair programming, don't do it. You know, you are free to choose. If you want to do it, do it. Otherwise, work alone. Strangely enough, when the people that most hated it had a choice, they started to pair program and they enjoyed it. Yeah. So basically, you have to be careful there. Yeah, you have to satisfy your customers that are the users of the methodology. They better be involved. Yeah, so the company efforts, you know, from now on we shall use Scrum in this way. You know, they don't work because it's from above, and also teams will have different needs anyway, even if it is the same company. And so having them doing the same kind of methodology is actually wrong for your company. Then is don't over constrain the system which means choose only the practices that match your main goals. You set the boundaries where they really matter. You don't want to kill people. Make sure that you use all the practices that will help you doing that. It yeah? can be even a checklist. Yeah? The doctors in the operating theater, they have a checklist of things they have to do before closing the patient so they don't forget you know, instruments inside and stuff like this, which it happens, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's, it's real. Okay. It's real. So the, be, uh, anything that can help you forgetting important stuff, yeah, as a rule of thumb. Leave secondary things alone. Just, you know, let people have some initiative. Let people being able to pick the phone, yeah. Why do you impose this thing on them? Yeah, why are you choosing, uh, why are you trying to constrain the system from all uh, the points? You know, you cannot predict everything. So instead of predicting, try to 
avoid damage when it really matters, leave everything else alone. Or otherwise, you'll end up like a, a big bank I was contracting for that at some point they had a prize for people that actually cut red carpet. Yeah, so bureaucracy. So they said they were also big science. These guys won, you know, were awarded. I don't remember now the prize because they to serve the customers of the bank, they cut red carpet, remove bureaucracy, you know, and they serve the customers. And when I saw that, I thought. They, these guys, the idiots, not the guys that cut red carpet, the idiots that put the sign, didn't realize that what they were writing there was, you are a bunch of idiots who put a set of arbitrary obstacles in front of these people, and they just said, you know what, remove them and, and solve the problem. So instead of awarding anything to those guys, they should have changed in the internal processes and methods to avoid the same problems the next time. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I think there has been a problem with a, a tool deciding to do it back. Yeah. So you cannot predict everything. Just avoid trying to do so. Also, because if you do that, I don't know if you know about the work to rule thing. That is basically is an industrial action in which employees do no more than the minimum required by the rules of their contract and follow safety or other regulations precisely in order to cause a slowdown rather than to serve their purposes. Yeah? In some countries, a way of having a strike is we'll follow the rules in a religious way and we'll show you something. Yeah? So basically, if you try to overconstrain the system, you are designing yourself something like this, a work to rule scenario where nothing moves ever. But also, there is, what about this? We have this, so are they that bad? I mean, the very big ones are bad, in my opinion, because they're too complicated. But the real thing is, you can still make use of them. So if you don't know where to start, so you, you are not an expert in methodology, you don't have uh, say, access to experts to help you, you can always say, you know what, this is our context, Scrum kind of fits our context more or less, yeah? So you start from there and then start adding what you need and removing what you don't. Uh, but removing what you don't, I mean also removing things that make Scrum, Scrum, yeah? It's just like, I don't know, when you write code, you use a new framework, you want to use it in your context, then you find some examples on the web, you copy the example, paste in your ID, start fiddling with it, yeah? So basically, make the example run, then you start fiddling, changing, changing it, and say, ah, now solves my problem, now I'm done. It's basically using them in the same way, to avoid the blank page uh, situation in which it's like, okay, I know where I am, but I really don't know how, how to build a thing for me, yeah? So this could be starting points. Uh, then I put this, what about scaling up? I kind of, I didn't know if to expect the question or not, so I put this. Uh, now, my personal opinion is that all this talk about sc scaling agile is, is a scam. It's, it's completely pointless because it, it's not interesting. You don't want to scale agile. What you want to do is to, in, in situations in which you have truly big projects, to try to get the hang of them and make them work, which is not about really scaling up anything. It's about finding a way to make the thing work. Yeah. Why, you know, director level managers, why should they use Kanban or Scrum or anything else? Does it always make sense? I don't know. I, I'm not a manager at that level, so, I, you know, for me it's kind of, it's, it's not right to go there and say you should be really using Kanban. Maybe it works, but maybe it doesn't. And so the focus, again, should be this is the situation, how can we act on this, yeah? And by the way, most companies I work with, you know, investment banks are big companies. I have uh, consulting with other ones that are big companies. They don't need this scale-up thing. Even if they have teams working together on the same product, yeah? They are using Scrum in each team and they synchronize with each other and they do it well. They don't need all these uh, scaling up. And we are talking teams of 10 people, maybe five, six, seven teams, which is, you know, it's not a huge, as huge uh, like a, uh, could be a Microsoft uh, project for uh, Windows development or stuff like this, but still it's big enough, you know, that in most companies is the kind of as big as it can get, yeah? And you don't really need to think about scaling. What you need to think about is how are we going to synchronize this, yeah? And then try to solve the problem from that point of view. 
This is my opinion. And I've never seen, uh, and I'm always also very doubtful when I hear things. I was at a talk about, a talk about SAFE the other day. Uh, I was unconvinced by the claim, it is here and is proven to work, because I wasn't shown anything. I wasn't shown any real example, I, not even, you know, not talking about scientific proof, okay? I'm talking about example, yeah? So stuff like this. So I think I finished the slides early, but I hope you'll have lots of questions or comments. But I have a final rant. That is, I think we need to fundamentally change the conversation about methodologies which in my opinion is to focus in the unachievable goal of finding the one that will work for every context. Which to me, this is the focus of the community at the moment. I think that is completely wrong and is, is leading us in the wrong direction. And this is it. So any questions, comments? Y yes, you actually. What I w what I think you actually will end up with variations with a, a variation per team, yeah. literally, and p to the point that they could, it could be completely different ways of working teams. And the thing, the problem you may have is how to synchronize teams that work differently. Okay. But then at there, what I would try to do is try to synchronize using, you know, what are the expected outputs when, and try to agree on that, yeah? There has to be a conversation there. This is what I would try to do. This is what I've done in, in projects I've been, uh, I've been involved with, and generally works. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy, but it's something. Yes. Yes. Now that trade off again, the cost and budget also applies to that as well. And that's something which is difficult to predict whether they are going to actually accept it or they'll have to let it go and they'll say, okay, it's not good enough. Okay. You, you can run experiments on that. Yeah. You can say, for two weeks, we'll try this. Of course, people that have to do that have to agree. Yeah. They have to see that there could be some benefits. It's just that the benefits are not clear, totally clear yet. Yeah. So you can always say, okay, let's give it some time, two weeks, and try to do that and see, you know, what you get out of that and see what is the experience. And then you can decide if you want to continue doing that, maybe with some variations or maybe ditch that or whatever. Yeah, of course you need to, uh, now in every project, I think you have to have anyway, allow for some slack to learn stuff, basically, you, you, one thing you should avoid at all costs is having your people busy 100% of their time in project stuff all the time because it's a recipe for burnout and they won't have time to learn anything. Yeah, it's like when you, when you write also applications that run uh, 24 hours, seven days a week, you don't write, you don't put the, machine, the hardware and say so you can utilize that 100% all the time. Usually you aim at let's say 50% possibly 60, 
partly, you know, in part to allow also for peaks of activity. Yeah? The same goes with people, but in this case, in, well, in this case, uh, you may have the peaks of activity because you um, somehow uh, have an estimate that went wrong, so you have to do more work, but also, if they finish early, probably want them to learn stuff. Yeah? Or in cases in which are experimenting, they will be slower for a while, and you need to keep this into account. And it's like, you have to consider this as an investment that will pay back later. And some of these investments actually pay back very, very soon. Yeah? From a technical point of view, if you write your acceptance test, automate them before writing any code. I recently have been pushing some things that were not doing that, and they were, ah, oh, we have a testing phase at the end of the scrum. They had one week of testing that, of course, meant piling up bugs on the next sprint. Uh, until I asked them, they seemed not to realize that. And then I convinced them to go the other way around. Try to do this. Just give it a go. Yeah? You can ditch it if it doesn't work. When it, they tried that, on the same sprint, they started to realize how good it was. You know, they didn't have any that many bugs at all. They didn't have to have a final week of bug fixing or stuff like this. Yeah? The payback was immediate. Another team, a recent one, they had like for the particular, is, they do some complicated things. And they had a verific what they call a verification phase at the end. It's like the software does something to make sure that it works. So we have a baseline to test uh, things against and what the software does, which means basically text files. And they were doing this manually, which meant one person a week to run the verification. Horribly expensive. Then I asked them, why don't you just automate that? It's text file. You can leave things. They tried that. All of a sudden, instead of one week, it was two hours. Yeah? So depending on what you do, depending on the practice, you can have, you know, it's, it's an investment, but some of them pay back almost immediately. Some won't, you know. You have to learn TDD requires some practice, yeah? Or pair programming, you need to acquire the ability to maybe communicate better with your pairs, or depending on the person, maybe to have a shower sometimes, you know. <laughs> this is a <laughs> problem that some people mention, but I'm joking, but basically you need to change some, some behaviors, and, and to change that, you need to learn. Yeah, I need some time. But it's an investment that usually pays back. If it doesn't pay back, you can do something else. Yes. You have to, uh, to plan for Basically, when every time, if you have a sprint planning, if you scrum, you don't go to the sprint planning knowing nothing. Yeah? You go there knowing the stories you are going to talk about and having an idea. You need to get context. Yeah? Otherwise, it will be a huge waste of time. Yeah? Think there. Are Well, if you read safe, it covers most of the things oh, as well. No, 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 I'm saying DAD does. If you read safe, we'll do as well. The problem there is the approach. Let's see if I can go back. Is the approach. I've got a solution. Give me your problem. Yeah? Also, ah, there is an aspect I didn't mention. You want your, the parts that are codified of your methodology, okay? So the bits and pieces that you choose to set some boundaries because they're important, to be few, a small page. Because everything that I cannot remember, I won't do. Yeah? We just follow safe. Okay, now what, what am I supposed to do now? Yeah? Basically, I if it's not something that makes sense for people and is easy to follow, it won't be followed. Typical example, you know, if you do Scrum, you know the definition of done. I've seen teams that uh, waste a huge amount of time giving, you know, a uh, hundred pages book to define done. And then they have broken builds and nobody cares. Say, what's going on here? And what goes on is that it's so long and cumbersome that they just forget about it. Yeah? Th this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Why But you see, it makes you free to make your choice. So whereas it's not very rigid as a best practice. So that's why I asked why you're doing it. That's only curiosity. 
basically, I, I go the other way around. I have a problem, I build a methodology. It's not I have a methodology, I remove stuff to fix my problem. Because I think it's much more useful. You want to start as small as you can and keep it as small as possible. And leave, you know, because it will simplify what you need to do. And I, I say this also from direct experience, okay? So I, I consult, but I also work in teams. I know what we do in teams. I know how we ignore stuff, yeah? So this is what I say. But the good thing about this is that you can actually sell them. You see, uh, the approach I'm talking, uh, I'm telling you is not, first of all, it's not a methodology. If you like, if you want really to classify, it could be a meta methodology, how to build your own, yeah? But it's not something that you go and sell and sell certifications, which is uh, actually a big minus point for me. Yes, yes. Figure out if it works for you or it doesn't work for you. Yes. Right? So I've seen people very quickly jump to a conclusion in, like you said, two weeks, a month, and say, oh, it's not working for me. And so they can't. Yeah, no, it. and that is where, uh, you know, you have to use the only tool that matters, that is the brain, right. and think, okay, let's talk about it. What is not working here? Yeah. Right. This should be the way retrospectives are used, but unfortunately, often are just uh, empty ceremonies in many things. Yeah. But it's really thinking deeply, okay, this is what we have been doing. Basically, when you are trying something, you are at the level of uh, maybe novice or, uh, you know, maybe become competent. Basically, you are very aware of what you are trying, and you try to understand the mechanics, yeah? And then you need to understand what of the bits are actually mm, not working for you and why, and then you can decide. Uh, people sometimes do jump on this because uh, they just want to try new stuff. You know, it's cool. It's but typically, engineers look with this hand and try and write it down for a quarter. Let this regular, even if you are seeing some shortcomings, before you decide to break it apart. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with that. You know, you don't want to jump, uh, randomly jump from one thing to another, you know. It's the, the same thing you don't want when you have a new interesting project developers to choose their technology, their pet technology simply because they want to try it. Yeah. It's important to have a, a way of trying stuff, but since it's something you are selling, it's better to try it in a controlled way, yeah? It's no more like, I'm interested in this, so my CV will be better. But you see, the thing there, what you need to care about is the outputs, what they are producing when. Are the outputs the one you expect when you expect them? This is all you need. So, and, and, but also you need to put among the outputs, sometimes you need to put also things that will help you understand in the situation, so some form of reporting. By all means, avoid the uniform reporting, you know, that... But uh, some form of, so this is also a way of organizing inf the information radiators. So some teams I know of, actually they did something interesting with one tool, was there, they, I don't remember if it, they used something from uh, the JetBrains guys. Uh, anyway, they, they, they used a tool and they have their own boards there. But the tool can also give you statistics, you know, can make, churn the numbers based on the information given. <coughs> And you can crea create customizable, customized b views for different people. So they had the CEO that needed to have some form of understanding what was going on. They created a customized view from the same data for the CEO. So it's not about one information radiator. It's the appropriate one for the appropriate audience. Yeah? And by doing that, actually, one thing that CEO realized was with my fiddling with this team, I'm actually causing trouble. He realized that, he, because he could connect when he intervened, you know, 
telling the guy, oh, you really need to do this, and some dips in uh, productivity or stuff. Okay, so there is a way to deal with that. But the way to deal with that is not imposing uniformity in, in, a, in a blind way. It's, it's more like, again, what are your goals? What do you need to make sense of what is happening? Because at the end of the day, for a company, what matters is what you deliver. Yeah? <laughs> No, but I, I'm not advocating depending on a particular uh, guy. I'm advocating of actually making the teams as effective as they can be and working out everything else around this, okay? So instead of saying I need this so everybody will be uniform and I know how to look to things, is no, 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 no. I make these guys as effective as they can be. Now I'll figure out how to, to verify what they are doing. So it's, it's exactly the other way around. This is my, my take on that. And it's actually simpler than what it seems. It's just that it seems, as humans, we like a lot of uniformity and symmetry and, uh, you know, and Microsoft project diagrams, you know, it's, it's stuff like this. But <laughs> no, I'm not saying that too late, but I'm saying, you know, it's, it's very kind of. I think, well, there are definitely different levels of, of maturity, but I think that uh, even people that are beginners, you know, put in front, these are the problems. What you need to do there is, of course, you can't have a team of beginners only, yeah, because if you have to deliver something, otherwise, you know, you have a problem. But what you can do there is also start, you know, offer alternatives and discuss things and say, what do you think about this and that? We can use that. So you, you don't go there saying, just do this. People have to understand what they are doing and why, and the value. Not only the value, also the consequences, yeah? But you can do this with uh, any team, really. Of course, if you have a team of only beginners, you have some other problem to solve, yeah? Because you won't deliver anything because they will have to learn l lots of stuff. So probably won't be able to. You, you will have to form them anyway. I tell you what I do, I, what I typically do with beginners in my teams. Uh, so I give you a, a specific example here. Uh, I was a team lead in a quite complicated project in an investment bank. We had to coordinate six, seven teams to do stuff that was important for the bank. And I was given a, a, an intern, yeah? So someone that was at university, no real experience in the workplace, and he was there to get, learn some. The first thing I did, I made sure that I, I told him, look, I don't care how much you know. You are one a member of the team, yeah? Your voice here is as important as everybody else. And I meant that. And I made sure he understood that. And then, you know, he, you know, we treated them as a peer, of uh, him as a peer, but also in some things, you, you take the time to work together, you know, show how to do some things, get stuff done. So basically, it's a kind of mentoring process. Interestingly enough, in this process, I learned a lot from him, including things like he solved us a problem that we thought it would have taken us one month. He had a bright idea, it took us less than one week. Yeah? But basically, it's like, first of all, you are part of the team. It's not that you are a beginner. You are you know, considered an inferior guy. No, you're not. You just know less of some things in some context because you know, in others, you may know more. Yeah? And then there is an, an approach of mentoring, working together, doing stuff together, and showing, you know, is a process of really growing together there, yeah? I know th this is the kind of very fluffy explanation, but it's, it's difficult to explain in, a, in, a, in another way, yeah? I, I can't give you a tick box there. What I can tell you is, for sure, always act consistently. Do what you say and say what you do. Because if you don't act consistently, you just confuse people. Any other? 
Okay, we finished 40 minutes early, so you should, be, you should thank me for that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'll make the slides available uh, in the site if you're interested, and feel free to drop me an email with any questions or anything. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>